Australians getting poorer. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your stein of coffee, let's have a look at this ABC News article discussing if you've been feeling poor over the last decade, this graph explains why. And it's written by Gareth Hutchins. Now, before we go through this, and you can see here it's all about wages, I want to draw your attention to this Excel table I made last year. And this is showing our per capita, per person GDP growth. So that means the economy, you know, we're growing. It's still growing. It's still good. You get all the positive headlines and the spin from the politicians. They're happy. GDP growth is good. But... You need to look at it on a per person basis. Now the black line I've got here, and the, the video is called, Is Australia in a Depression? Because the black line I have here is the trend line. That's the trend line from back where we got the, the data first per capita in 73, everyone. So you can see here, you know, there's some periods when it's below the trend line, particularly the recessions. Now, have a look during this time, during just right about here, the GFC. We have been the majority of moments under the trend line. We are growing either at or below trend the majority of the time. So one could make the argument that the Australian economy has been depressed on a per capita basis since the GFC. Because there is no technical definition of a depression. Try, try and look it up and find it. I prefer the, the term that it's prolonged uh, growth or decline below trend levels. That kind of makes sense. Kind of feels right too. And if we look at wage growth as well, it it hasn't it doesn't feel like it's grown at all. From a from a professional perspective, as an architect, I get the feeling our fees have not grown at all since the GFC. It depends on who you talk to. There's some of the older blokes; they can still get away with charging quite higher fees. It depends on the circumstances, but in general, it, it's. I was talking to some other people; it's it's pretty competitive still at the moment even though apparently everything everything is booming. So let's have a look at this, everyone. Let's see what they're talking about. So have a look at the gra graph below. It shows what happened to real household disposable income in Australia between 92 and 2020. You'll see three distinct periods. Okay. The dotted line mark the average growth rate in everyone's disposable income in each period. So, oh boy, look at that. 92 to 2000, the productivity boom. There you go. 0.5. The resources boom. You know, there you go, it's growing. And dog days. <laughs> I mean, how's your... Well, we've seen a spike in disposable income now because of just money flooding the market. But could... Yeah, here's another thing. Could this also be for a, through a cultural shift that people consider things necessities? Like we saw yesterday, the, the young couple who couldn't get a house for with their forty thousand dollar deposit because they were looking in the wrong areas. They they wanted to live, you know, the beach lifestyle on a forty grand deposit, and they thought that plastic nails and hair foils were a necessity. At least they got rid of it. Hopefully they're improving. But could this be? the development of the instant gratification culture while people don't have as much disposable income rather than realizing what isn't. Maybe, maybe. So, as you can see, between 2013 and 2020, there was virtually no increase in average household disposable income. Do you feel like your take-home pay was stagnating years before the current recession? You weren't imagining things. Unfortunately, that stagnation is going to continue, but more on that later. Australia's dog days. Professor Ross Grant, a prof um, professorial research fellow in economics at the University of Melbourne, has included the above graph in his new book, Reset, Restoring Australia After the Pandemic Recession. The only problem with that is he's, he's leaning too much towards MMT. But anyway, he dubbed the years from 13 to 19 Australia's dog days. He said the graph doesn't fully reflect how bad things have been for average workers since 2013 because an average rate of growth in disposable income can be pushed higher by large increases for those at the top while real household income per person for most falls. We can see the difference between 
the median the average wage is what 1700 a week then the medium median is around 1100 so that's a big difference everyone between those two two ways of measuring where where most people sit this was the case in the dog days as top executives and business income were rising rapidly growth well i'd say a lot of mining income as well in the boom there'd be a lot of people working there and they wouldn't be executives they'd just be professionals the professor professor's description of australia's macroeconomic performance since 2013 will feel familiar to many people he said in the late 90s and early 2000s were a period of relative prosperity during the first two decades of the long boom from 92 to 2012 Average Australian incomes measured in international currency rose from the lower half into the top few of developed countries, he said. By 2013, they were one quarter higher than in the US. But things changed notably from that point. Economic growth continued from 2013, but with much slower growth in total output. Stagnant output per person and decline in the typical household's real wages and income per person, he said. In the seven years from 2013 to 2019, the whole developed world experienced slow and grumpy times, but Australia drifted to the back of a slow-moving pack. Unemployment has never again fallen to anywhere near the 4% it was on the eve of the GFC. Underemployment has grown and grown. Average household disposable income ended the seven lean years where it began. In 2019, average Australian incomes measured in international currencies were one quarter below those in the United States. To emphasize... How, uh, just how bad it was from 13 to 19, he says it was a period of income stagnation for ordinary Australians unprecedented since. And starting to challenge in long longevity the Great Depression of the 1930s. I mean, anecdotally, guys, let us know in the comments how have you felt it since that period in the last 10 years. So, in the best of circumstances by 2025, Australians will have lived through the longest period of real income stagnation in our na national history, he warns. The failed attempt to record a budget surplus. The professor notes that what successive federal treasurers were trying to do with their budgets and failing to do since 2013. There have been 16, mostly six monthly budget statements by four treasurers since the beginning of 2013, he said. The first 14 statements projected budget surpluses within a few years. Every projection then suffered a major downgrade. The last two budget statements obviously recorded some of the largest deficits in Australian history. As an aside, it is worth remembering what a budget surplus actually is. In one sense, a budget surplus is simply an accounting term that describes a situation in which the federal government is sucking more money out of the community via taxations than it's, it's spending into the community for infrastructure, services and programs. So we need to reduce taxation, everyone. We need to reduce the burden the state places on people and maybe scale back the role of government in our lives. There doesn't seem to be... Is there any public advocation for that in Australia? Uh, in the mainstream media, do we see that anywhere? It, it, you know, the default just seems to be more government, more government, more intervention, more protection. But in another sense, a budget surplus can be an extremely important tool of macroeconomic management because it slows the economy down by taking spending power away from households and businesses and this is the the problem with the mmts guys it's just going to be evolve into more control more central planning more government involvement in your lives one way or another and just wait till we get central bank digital currencies it's going to be a dystopian nightmare the potential of that is it's quite terrifying so in a period of historic income stagnation for Australian households, successive federal treasurers were pursuing budget strategies that were slowing the economy down, thereby contributing to the wage stagnation. So high rates of immigration held wages down. Uh, crucially, one of the major dynamics driving Australia's wage stagnation between 13 and 20 was our country's immigration policy, the professor says. In early 2000, the Howard government began sharply increasing Australia's immigration intake and the policy was continued by subsequent Labour and coalition governments. The shift in policy caused, caused Australia's population to swell by 35% since 2000, from 19 million to roughly 25.6 million by July last year. And we can see that here on a per capita basis, why things are getting worse, guys. Why housing is getting more expensive, you know. 
Australia, look at that pop, 35% growth in our population since 2000. Everyone, that is just insane. Where are the new cities? Why do you think housing is so expensive? Why do you think you have social issues? That's worth reading again. A population swelled by 35% in 20 years. And I've done videos on just our potable water capacity. It hasn't kept up with our, pot with our population growth. You know. <clears throat> and it was accompanied by a change in the composition of our immigration program, away from permanent migration towards temporary migration, which made things harder for some Australian workers. The overall effect was to integrate much of the Australian labor market into a global labor market for the first time, the professor said. Integration into a global labor market held down wages and inflation during the resource boom, but it contributed to persistent unemployment, rising underemployment, and stagnant real wage growth during the expansion of total economic activity during the dog days. It contributed to the historic shift in the distribution of income from wages to profits. Increased immigration contributed to total GDP growth, but detracted from the living standards of many Australian working families. The professor says those higher levels of migration and the explosion of temporary migration had social and cultural as well as economic consequences. One such consequence was cultural and racial diversification, especially in large cities, he said. This has benefits. Young Australians from all backgrounds are now more closely familiar with people of Asian backgrounds. But there were also a downside, especially from the interaction of the uh, of the economic with the social effects of the increase in scale and change in composition of migration. For the first time, large numbers of migrants were not on a path to citizenship. I mean, see, that's interesting because my father was a migrant and he was very proud that he became an Australian citizen. He used to show off his, his citizenship card. And I mean, he experienced racism when he came over here. He was a German. You know, you cop it, guys. But he was proud, and he loved Australia. The temporary migrants also have less knowledge of their rights in the labour market and were vulnerable to exploitation. Breaches of labour laws on wages and other conditions became common. So, reduced public expenditure on settlement assistance, including English language education, compounded these effects. He said in 2003, he compared the effect of immigration in Australia and to the United States for then Federal immig Immigration Minister Philip Ruddock, and he concluded that the higher skill content of Australia's program meant that while immigration lowered the pay of lower workers in the United States, immigration tended to rise the pay of lower workers in Australia, and probably uh, decrease it of higher educated workers in Australia. But changes in the composition of Australia's migration program after 2003 reversed that tendency. Since then, the composition of Australian immigration has moved closer to the American model, he said. Immigra immigration now lowers the income and employment prospects of low-income Australians. In the new pat if the new pattern continues in Australia, it may eventually cause a similar reaction to unskilled immigration as that written by presidential candidate Donald Trump in 2016. Well, yes, it's the, the dirty, unwashed masses that no one cares about, average Australians that are frustrated. You know, and you'll see, you'll see a shift. You'll, you'll see a more a nationalistic shift, everyone. And then poor people that come over here to try and make a better lives of themselves will, will bear the brunt of that. Because, frankly... They're overheating our country, everyone. 35% growth in 20 years is insane. That's not natural population growth, everyone. That is insane. I wonder how many people don't realize it's grown that much. If you want to, you know, all you, you know, hippie greenies, if you want to, um, if you want to really have an impact to save the planet with the environment, you need to stop global immigration you need to stop people coming from less advanced countries where their carbon footprint is lower going to more advanced countries you know close the borders to europe and america and australia all the first world countries that'll that'll have a bigger impact on the environment if you really believe that stuff you know they'll never do that for those reasons the professor says 
He favours shifting the balance of Australia's immigration back towards permanent migration away from granting so many temporary visas. One change could ensure that recipients of the renamed successors to 457 visas would have skills with economic value above the Australian average, requiring them to be paid at least average weekly earnings, he said. One consequence of restricted immigration, rising living standards. With international borders closed, the level of migration to Australia has plummeted. In the June quarter last year, net overseas migration to Australia declined by 5,900 people, meaning more people left Australia than arrived. It was the first time since mid-93 that Australia recorded negative net overseas migration in a quarter. In two weeks... We'll find out what happened in the September quarter last year when the ABS publishes the data. It's highly likely we'll see two consecutive quarters of negative NOM. In fact, the federal government thinks Australia's net overseas migration will suffer a loss of 72,000 people overall in the 2020-2021 financial year. It will be the first time since 46 that Australia will record negative net NOM for a 12-month period. It will be followed by another loss of 22,000 people in 21-22. Professor says much lower immigration will hold back total output growth in coming years, but it may improve the living standards of most Australians. He says the sudden halt to immigration provides an opportunity to reassess our immigration policy and to think about the scale and composition of immigration that will contribute most to broadly shared goals. This is likely to be uh, there's likely to be electoral resistance to resumption of anything like the immigration levels of the dog days, he assumes. Settling early on an immigration program that is moderate in size and strongly focused on valuable education and skills will help us avoid contentious and diversive political debates at a time when our society and uh, polity are under great stress. He said once we begin rebuilding the economy and on the other side of the pandemic, it would make economic sense to set the new level of net immigration to the same level as it was during Australia's productivity boom at around 0.5% of the population per year. That would be half of the level of the dog days, he said. So there we have it, an interesting take on Australians feeling poorer, well, due to increased immigration. What do you think? What's your take? Anecdotally, do you agree or do you not? Let us know in the comments down below, everyone. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. If you enjoy the content I cobbled together here, there are a few ways you can support us. You can join us on YouTube or Patreon. You can support us using our affiliate links at Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve, or Aussie Broadband. You can buy a merch from Heiser Says, use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint, or support us via PayPal. Take care, everyone. Have a great day, and I will see you next time. Bye for now.